Here we are, let's get started then. So I'm Jonathan Worth, and what do I do? I, I'm a photographer, apparently. Hannah, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Hannah Halliday. Gosh, what am I? I'm a graphic designer, now educator. And Jude, who are you? Hi, my name is Jude. I like to call myself a storyteller. So, yeah, I probably call myself a storyteller to make everything a bit more easier to, con to conversate about. Now, that's really annoying because I would have gone with that. I'm me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, we, so you're the star of the show, Jude. I mean, it's great. Thank you very much for joining us. This is awesome. Um, and there's so much about you that I would, I, I would love to learn. So, you know, we're, your audience today is is a room full of master students. Oh, yeah, the room's bigger than that, right? But obviously, but your primary audience today is a room full of master students, and they are they're illustrators, animators, filmmakers, photographers, graphic designers. You've got the full Schmurgers board there. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're so happy to speak to you is because you're pretty much all of that plus music. Yeah. So tell us about some of it. You, you call yourself a storyteller. So um, wh why is that? Why are you a storyteller? So I think primarily, well, first of all, thank, thank both of you for having me, honestly. It is a uh, privilege. So I, I call myself a storyteller mainly because I feel like as creative people, it's our job to kind of translate people's thoughts, people's stories into a more, I guess, digestible form or a more, I guess, a more expressive form. So for me, I've realized that in every single aspect, be it in the music field or in the design or photography, it's always been about storytelling and about how to convey that in a more interesting way or something that can cap in, like capture someone's essence. So I think that's why I end up calling myself a storyteller. I think when I start to say, oh, I'm a graphic designer, photographer, this and that, it can become overwhelming, not for just people who hear it, but myself as well. Because I feel like at times a story might not need you to be all these things at once. And it makes you feel like, oh, maybe you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You know, I think, yeah, like I think Hannah would know very clearly me being in the undergrad course. When I left the undergrad course, I felt like, okay, cool, I'm not a graphic designer anymore. And I kind of felt like I had to park that somewhere and become something else just to be able to tell a new story or to be able to tell my story in a, in a different way. Do you know, that's, it, just, that's going to be so valuable for sort of students to hear, because especially the, the, the ones you're speaking to today, because they're at a point right now where they're being asked to sort of describe what their next steps are, to imagine themselves. And, and they're, they're very much... What school school really loves to put you into a box, doesn't it? Right, you, you, you go away and you say, "I'm going to do a course now in graphic design or film or whatever it is," in, with the intent of becoming a graphic designer or a filmmaker. And those boxes can be so limiting. We had a professor of comics, Professor Nick Susanis, professor of comics at San Francisco University, started out as a mathematician who loved to play tennis, who carried on playing tennis, was going to become a pro tennis player, wasn't, didn't make it. But became a, 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 a cartoonist, a, a, a made graphic novels, becomes the professor mm -hmm. of comics. And one of the things that he told us is about sort of breaking out of boxes. But how did you how did you feel as a student? You know, when you were on your course, because you, you didn't start it in graphics at BA, did you? No, I mean, it, I guess it will it will go a bit further than that. Being that in secondary school, I was still doing art stuff. I did photography. Then I did a diploma where I got to do a bit of woodworking, bit of like, you know, this and that. So it, it, yeah, it, I feel like it's, it's been a thing where luckily I have supportive parents who believed me, believed, believed in um, my ability to do. So they allowed me to kind of play around with a lot of different things. But yeah, I think, be, yeah, the box thing is something that has definitely been something that was difficult for me to even get out of. I think a lot of times, Especially, I remember secondary school. I had a, a particular tutor who wasn't really supportive of the the particular like routes I wanted to take, and most of it was specifically to do with my experience, being that I was someone who immigrated into the country and came with a completely different perspective than they were used to. But I think I was the only art, uh, the only black student in my year at the time, and because I live in Hertfordshire, it's a very white dominated area as it is already. So I remember in in those classes when I would say, I don't agree with this, for example, there was a lot of like apprehension on their side and like contention of like, why don't you agree with this? This is part of the module. This is this and this is that. And yeah, there was just 
this this level of rigid like rigidity that it was very difficult to kind of maneuver through especially because where i'm from a lot of things are very um fluid like our art is fluid our buildings are more fluid so coming to a more westernized uh, perspective where everything is more about you know structure and function over feeling it was it was very interesting to kind of maneuver through and the I, I think that's probably the the area where i struggle the most is figuring out how i could bring a more human feeling into design or photography or music or whatever it was as opposed to trying to figure out the algorithm and how to work the you know the structure so understand and form and grids and so on and so forth. So I think that's where I struggled the most. But again, it, I, I think there is space for all of it. I don't think necessarily that if you're a graphic designer who loves grid, that you are like horrible or like, how dare you? And it's, it's the same thing on the other side. I think that there, there has to be room for all of these things to exist in order for us to have some kind of balance, you know. So, so if you put yourself back now, because you you can tell that you're sort of you've got you've got the benefit of a, a, a certain amount of perspective and distance as you say these things. So, speaking to the people that are feeling like this now, right now, undergraduate, third year, about to leave, master student, you know, looking at four months before they they launch themselves, what's your advice you sort of give yourself right now? I, I think you kind of have to trust the process it, it might not look the same for everyone so i know for myself when i finished my masters i was in a bit of a sticky situation because funny enough i ended up relying back on my graphic design uh, degree so i did the whole photography and then basically said okay cool peace back to graphic design again so it, it's just about allowing yourself to go through whatever is going to happen sometimes it might not be the route that you are expecting for it to take. So what happened for me, if I if I'm remembering correctly, was after my my masters, I went to Ghana for a visit back uh, back to see my mom, and I was there for I want to say two three weeks, and going from a masters where I was primarily shooting on film, and it completely slowed down the process of being able to take pictures and being much more intentional to go into Ghana where everything was moving so fast and people are always on the move. You're hearing noises from like people shouting about businesses, so on and so forth. It allowed me to kind of change my, my, the way I was approaching my work, which was much slower um, and having to kind of adapt into this kind of situation. And I called the project, the people don't wait, which is this idea of like, even though I think, oh, I'm in the UK having this peaceful experience, so on and so forth, people are still doing things that they have to do to survive somewhere else. And being able to be in that space where I was, you know, taking these images and, you know, slowing it down. So I had to surrender myself to that experience, which ended up landing me a job later on in the music industry, funny enough, which is a weird story. But I think allowing myself to just experience those things without that restriction of, oh, I need to get a job tomorrow or I need a job, you know, before or because we're maybe in a recession and so on and so forth. I think I had the luxury of allowing myself to do that. I know that it might not be the same for everyone, but I would say just if, as someone who is like, I don't know if you're a master's or undergrad, if you are graduating, just ask yourself, like, what do you want to be a part of? Because a lot of people are looking to get into an industry that, might not necessarily be too kind to them so just putting yourself in that position where you can actually think hold on do i want to be in, in a situation where i am working a job that might look nice on my cv but i might not necessarily be happy about so i'd say just prioritizing your own emotions and your own feeling and your own like ethics first figuring out where you want to kind of belong and then going from there can I jump in? Because I wanted to ask about that. Is that okay, Jonathan? Because I was really drawn to that particular project when I looked at your website and it reminded me a lot of the purpose and the drive that you had, particularly in the surgery of the undergraduate. That you were never a generalist graphic designer. You always had um, a story to tell or a, a ra raise awareness of a certain issue. Is that still a driving force now, would you say, in terms of the clients that you work with? 
Have you found it challenging? Have you ever turned someone down because of their ethics or positionality? Yeah, yeah. I think I, especially working in the music industry, it's a very, for lack of a better term, it's a very diabolical space. So at times you are having to deal with characters with a lot of ego and a lot of um, uh, challenging, you know, ethical practices. And I'm very big on having an ethical relationship so I can do ethical things. And there, there has been situations where I've had to kind of contend with, like, okay, cool. Do I, do I do this because it's a good, it's a good chunk of change? Or do I say, okay, no, this isn't, it doesn't align with me. And I'll be honest, I've done both. I, there's been situations where I've had to work with people that I wouldn't on a daily basis agree with their, their way of life or their ethics or the way they do things. And I've, I've done situations where it's almost been for nothing. Like the situation I've done pro bono where it's like, okay, they don't have the money, but I'd rather do it just because I believe in what they're doing. And I'll be honest, the, sec- the, the latter is more fulfilling for me and the person that I am just because I want to be, be able to sleep at night and uh, the money, it, it comes and goes, you know, you can have a lot of money tomorrow and then suddenly it's all gone. And I've been at both ends right now where I am, where I've had a lot of money and I've had no money. And I feel like being able to sleep at night for me is more important, but it might not be important for everyone. I, I do understand that, again, everyone has different ethics and the way I approach things. But personally for me, I, I, I believe that if, if, if it's not right for me, then that's okay. I don't have to kind of sell myself short just to be able to do something that in a year, two years, even tomorrow, I might not be happy about, you know. There's sort of that sort of purpose-driven um, work that you know, Tana describes about sort of always being a story of something and you sort of, dig, I think a lot of people empathize, empathize I can for, for one, who trained with the aspirations of becoming a photojournalist and then, Mm. realized that I was too chicken to go running into war zones <laughs> and so ended up just doing editorial portrait photography editorial stories you know it's, it's, it's just like my life I think a lot of people recognize that sort of um, feeling of, of, of a series of compromises that one has to make yes. and the ones you're prepared to live with and ones you're not prepared to live with and those and everybody yeah. has to draw their own line there don't they it's, 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 it's interesting yeah is there other other of, of um, Jude's work that you'd like to talk about, Hannah? I mean, I'm thinking from your perspective as a graphic designer, because I can't speak to that. And there's an audience here. There are graphic designers. I mean, should we, should we, should we talk about actual work now? Because I look at it and I, I'm looking right now at the, the, the posters magazine covers uh, on yeah. projects on your website. And I and I love it. I love graphic design. And I love it all the more because I can't do it. Right? I, I start to lay stuff out because I know what I think looks good. And then it doesn't. Right, so the more that I can't do it, the more I, I, I want to be able to do it and value it when I see it done really well. So I'd love to hear you sort of you talk about it from your from your perspective, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I love, I find it joyful looking at your portfolio and the magazines. And I, what I find fascinating is you can see your eye through everything, and you can really see the different disciplines that you've trained within and are self-taught within. You can see the articulation, some of the videos in terms of the art direction, but equally the cropping and the lighting and the tone. And I think even the illustrators in the room will, will enjoy looking at all of those magazine covers. In terms of, I'm particularly interested in the work you've done for Channel 4, which you mentioned in your CV in terms of the, the short film projects. Was that a very collaborative project? Because that's the other angle in terms of you're you're so multidisciplinary. And I think that's really important part of this module as well. It's about people learning to work with different skill sets. And do you find that challenging? Because you can wear so many hats. Sometimes you're wearing Mm. a graphic designer hat, but you'd kind of want to get involved with the filmmaker. Or you're very good at stepping back and knowing your role and how you work with other people. Yeah, I think I, I probably learned that skill from graphic design because with graphic design is a very communal thing where you you most likely will be in situations where five people might be working on one thing at, at a time so I, it's definitely something that i learned specifically from graphic design that communal aspect so i do know when to pull back and when to kind of step in and say oh i think this i think that specifically with the channel four one so the person who actually commissioned me to make the sound for that sound design was a friend of mine who's a poet so it was one of those situations where 
they come to you with an idea and you, again, you have to kind of storytell or basically com compress that story into a different format or kind of translate into a different format. So it, it was definitely collaborative. I don't think it was as collaborative as it could have been. Like, I think I, I'm kind of, I'm the person who likes to kind of be all in with things. And I want to sit down with you, talk about why this and why that, what made, what, what made this decision this. But I think for that particular project, it was a, okay, I translate what you're telling me right now into sound and you go and do what you have to do with it. Where, with it. So yeah, I, I do believe that the, the communal aspect of, or the communal nature of design, be, being that graphic designers are problem solvers, I think that's something that I've had to figure out how, how, does, how do I look like as a graphic designer in music or how do I look like as a graphic designer in photography? So I, I will say that graphic design is funny enough, like you said, it's my eye. I use that as my eye as opposed to maybe photography because I think sometimes, especially with my, my phot photographic practice, I realized that it was very selfish. It, it, was, it was stories for me, for my perspective, whereas with design, it was about, okay, how can I, you know, express a particular feeling or, you know, have someone get something, you know. So yeah, it, it's it depending on what I have to do, I suppose I end up picking what kind of practice I have to be in. Because with music, again, it's about fig figuring out how you can get the best ideas to shine the most. Whereas design is about having everybody bring the idea and then world world through, through it and figuring out, okay, this works, that works, this works, that works. So there are like crossovers here and there. But yeah, I do have to decide sometimes to be like, okay, I can't overstep you know yeah it's tricky so what would you so in terms of it's interesting what you said there about being a problem solver but yet your photography work was quite selfish it was indulgent in terms of the way that you worked the magazine um covers and all of the, and the album covers and all of that kind of work would you say that that was indulgent or was that problem solving or was it a mixture of the two because it's a tricky one isn't it when you were you asked to just pour out your heart onto a cover or were there was there a brief that supported it i would probably go back to jonathan's uh, jonathan's point where he was saying sometimes you have to <laughs> figure out what you want to compromise on and i think when it comes to like artwork and working for a client especially when they're big like i don't know if it's a sony or universal music there isn't as much wiggle room as you you would have if it was your work or a more independent contractor so i think there's always been like a middle, like they might say, okay, I want to say this and you as a creative has to have to figure out how you can translate that in the best way possible. So I guess it is kind of problem solving because I think as designers, sometimes we're used to clients coming and saying, oh, make a bold, make a sparkle. I want it to shine. And it's like, what, what do I do with these words? They're not really expressive, you know? So it, it's just about having more conversations with, because I think this is one thing I realize is that the people who work in music, especially musicians, they're so talented when it comes to making the music, but they're almost clueless when it comes to like design or photography or the visual aspect of it. And hence why you have big creative teams or you have musicians who might have creative directors specifically for projects. So yeah, it, it, when it gets to those kind of conversations, I, I'm always trying to like ask them like, okay, why, why this? Like, you want this, but why this? Have you thought about this? Trying to almost like say, oh, have a look at this and have a look at that. You know, I remember there was a project where someone was asking me they wanted a particular shot and I had to refer them to like Carrie, Carrie Mae Weems, who I was like specifically focusing on during my master's as well. And I think it was, I think it's the kitchen series, if, the kitchen table series, if I'm not wrong, in the 90s, where she was taught, like she had this kind of almost mundane activity of just the kitchen table, but it being able to tell multiple different kind of stories. So expressing this to a musician, they're like, oh, okay, so this is what I'm trying to say. I see how this and that links together. But sometimes not if you don't have, I'm, I guess I'm a bit privileged in understanding or seeing it from different angles that I can be able to say, I see where you're coming from and what you're trying to express. But I know that for most designers, it might be a difficult task to have to figure out how to speak different languages, you know.
what I hear is is almost like you orchestrating things. It's almost like a, a conductor versus someone who's a gun for hire. It sounds it sounds to me like I'm listening to like an art director or a creative director. That's what you sound like to me, you know, which is which is great to have that sort of breadth of vision. Um, and it really does speak to sort of uh, thinking, not 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 boxing yourself in, so to speak, and having the confidence to to push yourself outside of a box as well. But and, and also what I heard as well, which I which I ever I imagine everyone who's been in a situation with a client who knows what they don't want, but doesn't know quite what they do want, and you end up doing all the things they don't want while they work it out, which is so frustrating. But um, is that idea of communication, which is so valuable, you know, and and also the point that you were making there about the the concrete example of an abstract concept is so valuable you know if you can't point at it you don't know what someone else is thinking you know which is and to, and to that point you know, i'd love you to talk about some work and that we can actually look at so what, what are the way markers that you would sort of identify and say well this was significant because and tell us why what informs that significance let me see because i'm thinking first project that I felt like I had the most, I guess, not control, but more so I had the most freedom to express myself in was probably the one I did for my undergrad final show. I think, you know, the funny thing is, again, because that book got stolen, so I have the, the, one of the other versions over here. And it's an interesting thing to look back at it like now and realize how, I guess, juvenile, the, the thought process was in going into that. Because I could tell I, I was biting off more than I could chew because of how dense that actual, you know, topic was. So that particular topic was more so about the, the microaggressions in the black community and how they're expressed and how they're taken. And this kind of like two-way conversation. And this particular version was a prototype that I made actually where I, I was talking about how, again, it's such a backward, backward conversation to, to talk about things that perhaps are stemming all the way back to eugenics, for example, and we're having these kind of conversations today. And like, I purposely made the book backwards and you have to like rip it open so on and so forth. And I had this kind of like big grand idea in my head. And again, I think as time has gone on, I have refined my approach in having these same conversations, but in a more acute, acute manner. Cause again, this is, this is a more brash approach. And I think that that there was a time for this, for me in my own career and I'm pretty sure that most people who are starting off their practice or trying to figure out what their philosophy is, are going to go through this particular stage and it comes in different cycles. I think, yeah, that, that, that particular one for me was something that allowed me to figure out what I believed in and what I was comfortable to, to, to say out loud. Cause again, these are a lot of taboo things that as a designer, you're kind of sometimes led to believe that you shouldn't have a voice that is too distinct. You should be able to kind of fit into this kind of like, yeah, almost like, like a peg. You're, you're, you're just kind of like a cog in the machine of like, you're just there to make, say things that people are going to pay you for and that's it. And yeah, I think that was one of the, the first moments where I was like, oh, I can actually say these things and like, who's going to stop me? You know, it's like, I, I, of course, I can, of course I can say these things because I care about them. And if I do, then I should be able to express them. And I, I was having a conversation with a friend <laughs> and we were talking about the Dada, the Dada, the Dadaist movement and how we felt like it, we need a resurgence of that because we just felt like no one's really challenging the status quo anymore. And it's becoming a thing where when that keeps happening, then we get into this kind of like utilitarian space where okay, this is this and that's it. And no one can ask like why. And it's just something that I've realized, especially with when I was a designer, or even now, as I'm still in my practice, that a lot of times people want you to, to just do. I think there's this famous quote someone said about a basketball player, a famous one saying, shut up and dribble. And I think sometimes it's the same with graphic design where it's like, oh, just shut up and design. You know, it's like, no one cares about what you believe in and what your ethics are and what you stand for or why maybe a particular font isn't the right choice or a particular color or, you know, all these things. And it's like, yeah, I feel like we, we, we need to, or 
specifically these kind of projects that I was doing back then was me trying to challenge and figure out how I can, again, reintroduce feeling into function. Because again, when graphic designers, of course, you're going to be like, okay, what is this for? Over, how does that make you feel? You know, and I was just trying to find my way through that conversation. So I would say that was like probably the first, the first like, attempt to, to it. And then obviously going into my master's course, of course, it, it was, com it was commercial photography that I was studying, but I feel like by the end of it, I, I, it was a completely different thing. It, it was just an exploration, further exploration into this particular topic, but just trying to get it into a more refined state. And I ended up talking about, you know, uh, a topic that was kind of dear to my heart at the time was about um, Ghana Maste and this idea of immigration and how that works, being that you have to kind of move into a new country and you kind of like in this state of limbo because you you don't really belong to the country you're in, but you don't really belong to the country that you left either because now you have to kind of form this kind of new identity for yourself. And I think it was it, it was almost like a subconscious conversation to myself because I was moving from graphic design to photography and it was just kind of like, okay, I'm moving from graphic design. I don't really belong in photography for because almost every single lesson I could remember was so as a graphic designer, what do you think about this, this thing? Or what do you think about this format? And I was like, wait, so am I still a graphic designer? I'm not really sure here. And obviously every graphic designer would see me and like, oh, you do photography now. So it was kind of like parallel to this topic that I was um, engaging in. And being able to, again, like I was saying earlier, slow down my process because that was the first time I was shooting more, you know, um, more film and being able to slow down this whole process and thinking about, okay, how do I find a balance between graphic design, which is going to end up in like, cause I used to make a lot of books at the time. And how do I find that balance between that and being an actual photographer as a practice? And yeah, it, it just kind of informed again, like, why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? What exactly am I trying to say? And I think most of the time, that was where I always kind of like, that was the question I'd ask myself before I did anything. So it allowed me to kind of find my foundation in order to do work, you know, and then obviously going from there into my professional, I guess, life. That that was when the the issues that I thought I had kind of overcome reared their heads because now you're dealing with celebrities and you're dealing with people with actual power where they could literally just say no you're fired and that's it and you're not thinking oh but you know this is a cause i can just come back tomorrow my chew is going to be fine with me having a little back and forth like you you couldn't have back and forth it was like this is it and this is final and just kind of like being able to be around people who thought like me but didn't necessarily act outwardly like me so they would agree with the things i'd say but no one would necessarily say okay yeah let's speak up about it you know and it, it was it, it's such an interesting thing because at the time that i went into my professional practice was right when uh, things like george floyd happened and covid happened so it was like just everything just straight away just smashed into me where i was like okay cool this is the same thing again it's like i'm in a place where I'm having to figure out if I should stand up for things or if I should just be quiet, sharp and dribble, which is like, just do the work, you know? And yeah, there was a lot of compromise in my first year. Things that I, to this day, probably regret that I could have done more, you know? And it's a thing where, yeah, sometimes it's, it's easier to be, to be quiet, you know, in the forefront and do the work in the background. But there has to be a time for everything. And I think at the time when I think there was a Black Co Coalition in the music industry, for example, where they were talking about how, like, things that you'd think are simple human rights, like artists should have therapy or they should have people, uh, lawyers outside of the music industry that could look over contracts and simple things like ethically that you'd be like, of course, yeah, why not? And I was having these kind of conversations and I was thinking, why am I having this conversation? I'm a graphic designer. I'm a photographer. Like I shouldn't involve myself in these things, but it's like, if not me, then who? Cause at the end of the day, I think, 
you know, art art plays plays a role similar to like religion, where you you have to be able to express what you believe in, almost like faith. You know, you're expressing something that people might not be able to see, and if if you don't do it, then no one else will, because no one else sees what you see. And I think sometimes, as especially as graphic designers, like they might take it for granted how important their perspective actually is because they think that's what the boss asks for and my opinion doesn't matter. But I think I've realized regardless of the situation, even if it's something as simple as packaging, like you expressing how important it is to say, okay, maybe these colors might be difficult for someone who is visually impaired to, to you know, to, to look at, you, you, that, that is something that's important. Like you need to be able to express that in the best way you can. And yeah, I think these, these like pivotal points in my career till now have allowed me to kind of just make sure that my voice is heard, not necessarily just me screaming, but being able to articulate exactly what I have in mind and at the least have a conversation about it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely that you brought it back to, to where you started out, actually, because it's an incredibly multi, multidisciplined perspective that you bring, which is lovely. And you started out at the beginning sort of saying, you know, it's a case of which of these disciplines, I'm paraphrasing, but which of these disciplines is the appropriate one to apply here and how much in order to tell the story in the best way, which puts me in mind of when you say story, I hear narrative, right? And, and we, we, we've been listening to David Campbell's, he, David Campbell, who is a ex-director of the World Press Photo Foundation, and he, he wrote this amazing lecture on narrative. And what he describes in there, he says, he says, narrative is a, is a series of otherwise unrelated facts which you put in an order and you create a timeline through. And you say, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And this is what we call these things. So this happened because of this. In other words, out of random facts, you create meaning, which when you talk about assembling these things in a particular way, using a particular set of tools in order to create meaning and then relate it to religion, I think, you know, that's really powerful. You know, and then when you talk about purpose driven versus being simply work for hire, you know, that's I think a lot of people will resonate with that. Shut up and dribble. Your job is a cog in the machine. Right. Versus. Where do you think this machine should sit or what do you think this machine should output or whatever? I think everything you're saying is resonating with me as someone, you even down to the regrets you describe. I could have done more. Man alive, let's compare regrets, but we haven't got all day, right? So, <laughs> so, so there's, a, there's a couple of things that are burning questions that I know that the, the, the student in the room is hearing right now, what's pressing for them. And it is the first one is how do you get work, right? So you're, you're, you're another step on from them, not that far, right? So it's not, out of, out of sight, you're just you're just a little bit further ahead than these guys, and so you are established. So you've taken that first step where you where you have a client base or you have a series of people you're working for. So right now, you know how how is it? How would you describe that clients can find you or that you reach out to them? Or, or what is the dynamic, indeed? Yeah, for me, it's relationships. So I think yeah, it is relationships. So when I worked at Warner. Um, my creative director at the time was someone that I built quite a good relationship with. And when he was doing other projects, he'd be like, I know someone who's great. Let's get Jude on board. And that would take me to this. And then that person would refer me to that. And I think, I think that's something that we might, I, I wish we were taught uh, from secondary school all the way to university and, and beyond was how to build actual relationships with people. Cause I think it's something that is very understated and how important it is to your career. And there's been times where I've been like absolutely piss poor broke. And I've just been like, Hey, I'm da 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 da. Is this anywhere? Let me know. And I'd be like, Oh yeah, of course. And then a day later they'll give me like, Hey, are you interested in da da da? And I'd be like, yeah, perfect. And that's just based off the relationship that I might have built. And it's not necessarily a, this kind of weird, cynical business relationship where you're only talking to someone because you want a job, but you're actively trying to get to know people's stories and where they come from and how they got to where they are. And 
I've realized that that's, that's been to my benefit in terms of getting work. For me, and I know it might work for other people, but for me, the traditional way of like applying for jobs and, you know, going through like, let's say LinkedIn and stuff like that hasn't worked like particularly well for me. And I know that most of the time it could be because of the content of my work and how I can approach it. So it, there is a disconnect, but again, like I do believe that everyone has a space that they can fill. And I think for me, a lot of the relationships that I've built have been able to allow me the luxury of having like work to do and not only work to do, but work that they know I, I would want to do. So being able to express how passionate I am about what I do has allowed people to be like, okay, this guy loves what he does. If we get him on board for this, he's not only going to give 50%, 80%, he's going to give a hundred percent all the time. And I think, yeah, I carry that through everything, like from my conversations to my work, I make sure that I'm very thorough. So I'll say that's like the first thing is just being able to build relationships. But again, this is something that is going to be difficult for people who might literally just be graduating because it's like, okay, I just graduated. What actually, what kind of relationship do I build with who exactly? But I would say what I did was, you know, just started working with what I knew how to do, which was I started making books. You know, I started making prints. That was something that I did. And I know that right now in this particular time we're in, it might be a different, it's 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 not the same as pre-COVID times where doing these kind of things would allow you this kind of, there was basically, there was a joy in the air back, back then. Now I don't know because I'm not really in it anymore. So I don't know how that would work. But being able to know that regardless of you getting a job after university, you are already who you study to be. So you're already a graphic designer. You don't need to be a junior graphic designer, midway graphic designer in order to call yourself a graphic designer. So you need to kind of carry yourself as such. And I think when you carry yourself as such, it gives you that confidence to be able to do work, regardless of what level it is, if you're working for the BBC or if you're working for an independent, you know, shop in, in your local area. So being able to carry yourself with the confidence that, you study the course, but not only just studied it, but you act, you're you actually doing the work. It it does give you a different kind of like, you know, because I, I realized when I left my master's and I'd go to, I'd go and meet like aunties and uncles and I'd be like, oh, I'm a photographer. And I'd be like, oh, really? Do you want to take pictures of my, you know, my, your niece, your nephew? Da, da, da. And I'd be like, yeah, sure. It, it, it sounds very mundane almost, but it's like, you'd be surprised the amount of beauty you can capture or the amount of work you can do just with people around you that would elevate or allow you to quote unquote, have a bigger portfolio to then show to the world. And I think sometimes when you have that much theoretical knowledge, you think you should be somewhere, but you still have to do the work. You still have to like do the little things in order to match up with your theory. You know, it's, it's almost like driving. You can't just say, oh, you know, I've done my theory test. I got a hundred out of a hundred. So I'm a driver. I can go on the road. It doesn't work like that. So just being able to match that, you know, theory with your practical knowledge, then that way, when you're in the field, you're not just having a confidence from what you know, about what you do, you know, I think is, is very important. So like, don't be afraid of just taking on like the little jobs that people might not necessarily be too proud to take. You know, I've done some, some, some horrible, horrible works back in the day when People would be like, no, I wonder. And the amount of things I charge, sometimes I'm even too ashamed to even say, say those prices now. But like just being able to do it so that it's like it's active practice for you. And then when the time comes and you're still up, you know, your portfolio is big enough and you want to apply for a studio, wherever the case may be, I think it will give you that much confidence when you get into the room. Do you know, I'm going to pinch that. I will, I'll, I'll quote you, obviously, but that is gold dust. Yeah, just passing your theory test with 100%. doesn't make you a driver yet. And, but yeah, and yeah, I'm a, somebody once told me, though, that you know, when, you, when you're face down in a job that is absolutely horrible, right? Everybody's done those jobs. Everybody's done those jobs. If you've not done them yet, you're going to do those jobs, right? The worse it is, the better the stories. Just remember that. That'll get you through, <laughs> if nothing else. Yeah. There's one one last thing I was hoping to pick up before I sort of hand over to Hannah to, to sign us off. But there's been this sort of theme which you've not actually articulated explicitly, but you keep referring to it as an undercurrent of it. And it, and it comes in that I, I, I hear it when you talk about building relationships. And you, what I'm hearing is like this 
authentic, this consistent, this this trust that you're building. That's what that's what I'm hearing. You talk about relationship building. I mean, that's that's just trust, right? People want to hire people they can trust to not cock it up. But, but, you know, but at the end of the day, and they, they want people they can trust to turn up. That's the other thing, stuff like that, because it's going to reflect badly on them if they don't. But then building that sort of trust and so on also goes, I see it as going sort of hand in hand with sort of markers that evidence that trust. So there's the trust of the creative who can create something that you trust will age well. Right. And so what I'm thinking of as you as you have been doing, given the descriptions of, of the work, significant work, you you cited actual physical things and you said, I started making posters, I started making books. So you talk about these physical objects quite often. How how important is the physical artifact to, in your practice? I mean, I mean, sound isn't really a physical artifact, is it? But the, the vinyl is, isn't it? The yes. Yeah. Is. It, it was more important when I started than it is now, just because of again the times that we live in. But I I think yeah, it's something that is very dear to my heart, just because of how I started my own practice. So it's something I always look back on, and I'm like. I, I wish I was back then just because the the ability to play when there's physical objects involved is is such a understated like you know relationship for creatives that a lot of people are missing out on and I don't think it's again it's similar to the theory and practical you don't really understand it till you're doing it when you have your actual work printed out before you or you have you know your designs like you know or a, a model or whatever the case may be having those having that physicality of it just gives you that extra like belief that you are you are a maker so for me it's very, very important sometimes I just print my work just because I want to see it and have that kind of physical like representation of work done because having it on your computer I have a thousand and one like files I have like at least seven one terabyte hard drives that are full of work that I don't go back to that often, you know, but I I have books. I have like prints that I'm always looking at. I wake up in the morning and it's right there. It's just a completely different relationship to have with your own work. And I think like as creative people, we need to be able to, even if it's not for anyone, for ourselves, be able to remind ourselves of the work we do. Cause I'm pretty sure between us three, there's work that we've done that we forgot we did. And it might just flash in front of you like, oh, wait, I was part of that. And then you completely forget. And just being able to remind yourself of what you've done, I think it's such a beautiful human thing. Like it's a beautiful human experience to know that you were created by someone, mother and father, whatever the case may be. And you're here and you're kind of adding on to that story of being able to make more things and not necessarily just make the world a worse place, but adding on to the beauty of what you came to me. I think that is like, the epitome of beauty for me is just being able to understand that you are part of this massive story that is being told across the world. And one day when you decide, you know, you're not going to be here anymore and your children see your work. And I think it was James Blake who found his dad's old songs and re-sang his dad's song. Like that's such a beautiful thing to have, like being able to have something passed on in a physical way and i i don't know how it's going to look like five ten years from now how this digital space and how digital curation and you know archiving is going to look like but i do believe that the, the, there's something that is never going to like it's a, it's a different experience it's it's not necessarily a better experience again that depends on who's taking it in but i do believe being able to sit down and open your portfolio in a massive you know a2 a1 she that that grandness of your work over like a 180 p pixel you know video it's it's never going to be the same experience and I, I would urge anyone who hasn't already printed or made physical stuff to just try i'm not saying you have to necessarily pivot your whole career <laughs> into making physical things but just being able to say you know what i'm gonna make a small zine of all the work that I've done. You know, I remember a friend of mine who was on the undergrad as well, Ben Wood. And he, I remember he, I remember being in the, uh, what is this, the name of this place? We're making zines and he made his portfolio into a zine. And I was like, Ben, this is amazing. To think about like 
the fact that you're sending this to a you know art studio and they're gonna see your work and even if they don't hire you they have a piece of your work forever it, it's just there, there's nothing that you know beats that and you know i do think that there is a spectrum for that there's some things that maybe like business cards that might not be as crazy important nowadays but you know being able to say you know i made this work i printed it i gift it to you you know or even make like make a birthday card for a friend or a family member like those things are like taken for granted you know and again it goes back to that whole thing of building relationships i feel like being able to trust yourself enough to make work that is physical it gives you that level of like okay you know what if I can do this, it will allow me to give every single person I know a different experience about how to relate to work, not just, oh, I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to send you a transfer. It's like, oh, check in the post. Something's coming for you. Like, no one, no, everyone's going to be surprised. Like, I tell people, like, people don't write anymore, you know? We're always, we're always typing it. And that's fine, but it's like, now you pick up a pen and you don't even know how to write anymore. Like, these kind of things are things that, like, I feel like innately we we need to have that level of physicality to balance out the digital aspect of how we relate to work, you know, because looking at a screen, it, it takes away the wonder of a lot of things like seeing the Mona Lisa in real life and seeing the Mona Lisa online. It's not the same experience. We, I think we could talk all day. What we what we missed, Hannah? I mean, I mean I'm, it's just been great. Oh, I, well, I, I didn't pay Jude for that last comment, everybody. Who I keep shouting, can you just start making some work, please? Stop showing me on screen. But I can't. I think we've covered so much. I think what's interesting is I was reading an article this morning. I'll send it to you, Jude, because you might enjoy it. And, and it's all about um, the multiverse and hypercycles and how we're kind of trends are becoming trending and trending on themselves. And it's kind of, it's all going to implode, maybe, hypothetically. And the fashion industry now bleeding into the music industry, moving, moving in, going into culture and, and culture and creativity being consumed like fast food, which I was like, oh my God, yeah. You know, Instagram and all of this stuff. So when you talk about the physicality, there are movements in terms of slowness again. There are cafes popping up which are offline and it's all about reading and writing and sketching and there's pictures and they look like they're almost museum settings because there's no screens, there's no one on a phone. There's like people like playing a guitar and listening to some music, but offline music. And I think that's really interesting. I wonder if you've actually just predicted the future, Jude, in your passion for physicality. So my last, I've got two quick, well, I'm hoping they'll be quick because I know we were going running out of time, but. I'd like to know where you see yourself going in terms of your practice in the next five years. Uh, in five years' time, I think I, I want to still be able to have the joy that I'm having with creating work now. I think for me, that's paramount, is just being able to still play. So if in five years I'm still playing, then I'm, I'm, I'm fine, you know. But in terms of, I guess, things that I'm passionate about, in terms of like things that I feel like, are going to come up with my work and I guess the world in general. Again, I think the, the the physicality of work is something that I'm very passionate about right now. A lot of my friends have have started doing more exhibitions and I think we've been encouraging each other like, okay, if you have work, try to get off the Instagram, like put into exhibition, like let's go and experience your work, you know? So I think, yeah, maybe human experiences is something that I'm going to be kind of like trying to figure out how that would look for communities now being that again we are we are quite digitized and we're accustomed to having things in a very digital i don't think uh, covid necessarily helped because it allowed us to kind of sit into it so now that we sat into it i think we're very like okay but why should i go outside but why should i go and see an exhibition oh that's too expensive it's cold it's i heard there's a flu out and all these things and just not being afraid to be human again like you know if you don't go outside and you don't, you know, have these kind of creative exchanges. I, I kind of think it kind of makes the 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 work stale, you know, because you're just kind of like going and saying, oh, I'm going to have some inspiration from Pinterest or Instagram. It's like, that's a very, very narrow source of inspiration to have. And I believe that, I, I believe that the greatest works were made from other people's works that were made from conversations. So I think 
if we can get into a space where the art can inspire conversations, I think that will be like, you know, the, the greatest thing to happen. And, you know, so, so I think that's, that's, that's one of the, own, the main things. And I think that art, trying to figure out how art can be a sanctuary again, like just being a sanctuary where people can come, especially now with all these things happening in the world, just being able to give people a bit more comfort, you know, I, I think, yeah, people are trying and we've been trying for a long time to escape from the realities of life with art. Um, we're almost like in a kind of like a hippie state right now. And with the implosions that happen in empires falling left, right, center, I think we're in a space where art should be able to say, okay, this is happening and this is dire, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. So I think hopefully in the next few years, that's what's going to be happening around us. But I will employ people who are like, you know, starting off their creative practice to consider anything that you're seeing should be something that is something you believe. It shouldn't be like, oh, you see injustice happening and you're okay with it just because it's like, well, I can go home and put on Netflix, for example, which is fine. But I, I don't think that every day is a Netflix day, for example. You should be able to balance it out and figure out what you believe in and what you can stand for, you know. Every day Amazing. is definitely Netflix day. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's it. That's, that's our quote from today. Got it. That's the headline. Judy, it's been beautiful. Thank you very much for making the time. How do people get in touch with you? How do they find you? I'm on social media. I think Instagram is probably the only place I'm usually quite active on. It's K-E-N-T-E-K-W-A-M-E. Kwame is my middle name. So if you did want to reach out, sure. I, I love to have conversations like you can tell. So if you did want to have a conversation, it doesn't have to be about the art, even if you want to talk about, I don't know, politics or something. I'm not really fussed. I just like to have good conversations. So if you're a conversationalist and you did want to have a conversation or you want to ask a question, you're totally welcome. We'll build a relationship indeed. There we are. <laughs> and thank you again. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for this. Thank oh, you, Brilliant. Pleasure.